So uh, my name is Kathleen. I am an assistant director for study selection. Um, and I actually was recently, I guess, re-elected or reappointed um, in this position. So I have actually been with the study selection committee since its inception um, four or five years ago now. So I'm, I'm excited to be continuing on in that role. Um, and my presentation today is really just kind of overviewing um, what our committee does, uh, a, a general overview of the process and procedures, and I'll give a couple minutes for questions at the end um, if anyone has them. All right, so the study selection committee is tasked uh, with selecting and reviewing projects for the PSA. Um, study projects go through rounds of actual selection procedures according to um, what are procedures that were put forth by the original motion all paper as well as some um, additional nuances that we have put together since then. Um, and the interesting thing about the study selection committee um, is that we have periods of a lot of activity and then a lot of downtime, which um, creates kind of unique challenges as well as benefits for serving on this committee um, in comparison to some of the other committees, which are uh, more or less uh, equally active year round, uh, regardless of when there's been for a call for proposals. Um, so the study selection procedures um, starts with an initial round of reviews that are internal. So after a call for proposals, um, we review the submissions for quality, um, whether the proposal is complete and well considered. We review it for feasibility. Um, which is both according to the PSA's capacity as well as the feasibility of the study to be implemented in a large scale multi lab context um, and whether we have the resources um, support the implementation of the study. Uh, from there, we um, decide to either reject the study because of, of quality or feasibility issues or send it out for full review. Um, this full review, round two, as I like to call it, of the selection procedures includes uh, reviews by experts on content. So these are topic experts, both um, internal to the PSA, as well as some external non-PSA member experts. Um, we also have our proposals reviewed by committee representatives, specifically um, people from the ethics committee, as well as the data and methods committee will review the study proposals in terms of those specific concerns. So the ethics reviewers will look to see if there are potential issues with um, compliance with various international rules like GDPR or um, potentially other ethical concerns for the welfare of participants. And um, though we haven't had any proposals for special populations or hard to reach populations yet, that would be a, a consideration if we were to implement a call there. Um, we also at this point have a network evaluation, and this is a pretty uh, straightforward rating that we solicit from the full PSA network, which is a quality rating as well as a potential participation um, possibility uh, rating. So how likely would they be a participating lab or otherwise be wanting to participate in another capacity with the study if we were to um, accept it for um, our study selection. Um, based on these reviews that we get back, the committee then decides to 
um, again, reject the submission, uh, request revisions based on our feedback or provisionally accept the proposal. Now, once a proposal is provisionally accepted, um, it's not officially a PSA study. It goes through um, needs assessment. This is a uh, new process and procedure that was implemented um, just within the last couple of years that is really designed to go into the weeds, so to speak, um, with these proposals, find PSA support, support personnel to staff and um, make sure that the projects can actually be implemented. And so even provisionally accepted proposals might not actually become PSA studies if we don't actually have the personnel capacity or ability to um, implement them in a way that um, is going to follow our policies and mission and all that good stuff. So for uh, study selection committee members, um, there are kind of different levels of responsibilities, as I mentioned, depending on whether we're in the downtime between um, calls for proposals or right after a call for studies. Um, so after that call for proposals, what I really ask is um, for members to commit to being available um, during the potential timeline, right? So like at the first part and then potentially after we get the reviews and network evaluations back, there's going to be a flurry of work. Uh, we try to do things on a two to three week turnaround for a lot of these um, review steps. And so the associated work with this, um, I ask for kind of a commitment to willing to be available and do that work at that time. And um, potentially, we've had Okay, can you hear me? Sorry, I just got a weird message about being muted. Um, so we've had members who um, of the committee who have um, not been able to participate in a brief time or who we've accommodated by having them more or less involved in different steps in order um, to make sure that their schedule or vacations were not um, too uh, problematic with uh, the timeline that we had in mind. Um, another thing as far as the actual review process for committee members, it's not, it's, very similar to what an um, associate editor or um, ad hoc editor might do for a journal, um, except it's also um, kind of providing a little bit of um, your own as well as synthesizing more information than potentially a typical journal editor would get. Because we have these ratings, we have more reviewers, we have the network evaluations, and then we have multiple committee members each looking at every proposal. Um, and so we ask that committee members give us both written feedback as well as numeric evaluations and then recommend decisions for each round. And as the um, committee chair, I make sure that I um, have a consideration of all of this information and propose based on their votes, a final decision and kind of get a, um, okay, we're all agreed um, sort of thing once that's all put together and we have uh, proposed decisions based on um, all this information. As far as during downtime, we kind of meet on an ad hoc basis. Um, I also ask that committee members uh, contribute to planning and documentation. So um, working on um, kind of procedures, policies of the committee um, and other things that um, are, you know, not going to necessarily have time to um, make 
beautiful when we're busy, but we can actually have some um, good downtime to make sure our documentation is up to date with um, and compliant with additional policies that might be added over time. Just um, one or two other brief um, points about kind of our challenges as a committee and some goals that I have moving forward. Um, in general, study selection has been um, a little inefficient as far as trying to quickly get feedback from um, the committee members as well as get reviewers to um, give their reviews in a timely manner. And um, we really struggled with the um, whole implementation of the COVID rapid projects and COVID itself in the last round of study selection um, to get all those studies into the system, into the pipeline and get a decision back to the proposals in a timely manner. Um, so that is one thing that I'm really working for for our next round, um, as well as I'd like to try to give our reviewers a little bit more guidelines. We have an incomplete review or guideline document that I want to facilitate completion of um, with the help of any committee members, um, as well as people from um, the various other committees um, for the things that are relevant to those um, and in general, I'd like to find ways to encourage proposals from underrepresented researchers, both in the PSA and certainly globally in psychology as a science. Um, one of the things about the PSA proposals and studies we've had um, so far is that they have been from either early adopters for the PSA, so PSA insiders, or people who already have a lot of resources within their own institutions and labs. Um, so I'm committed to find ways to make our selection process and the actual studies we se select um, more diverse in terms of the people um, proposing them as well as the actual topics that they cover and um, you know the areas of career and disciplines within psychology. All right, well, that is it for me. Um, I ha had a silly graphic there at the end, but um, I'm a little bit over my 10 minutes, but can maybe take one or two quick questions before we move on. All right, uh, Hannah, did you have a question or? I think others like raised their digital hands first, so we should. Oh, I thought those were claps. I didn't know oh, those are were hand raises. Their claps. Okay. Um, I was wondering, it seems like, you know, you mentioned that we haven't gotten a lot of proposals that that would be challenging to do with the PSA, but I think that we all kind of would be really excited to do something that wasn't, you know, a relatively simple procedure. And I'm wondering if you see it as your committee's responsibility to try to broaden those proposals or or should someone else or should many other people be trying to get that to happen? I mean, I think some of that can come to some of the like the community building certainly could have um, a, a hand in just reaching out to more people as far as again, subdisciplines or um, different areas of the world to try to get more proposals from them. I know that um, Protsco has um, an initiative in mind specifically to try to solicit um, proposals for hard to reach populations. So um, that I've talked to him about that and really encouraged him to include the study selection committee as part of that process just because um, so the burden isn't entirely on him um, and um, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what that timeline is and what his plans are for involving the different committees in that proposal at this point anyway. I missed his uh, talk yesterday unfortunately so I wasn't sure where it's gotten to at this point. 
but I, I do, you know, I gave a, <laughs> I gave a um, presentation last year, really kind of designed or um, around trying to get proposals from people who haven't proposed in the past and talked about some of the imagined as well as actual barriers to proposing a study. Um, and I do think that providing more resources for people who don't necessarily know how to do a registered report and um, those sorts of things when we have a call for studies and maybe having some people available to help those who don't have a lot of experience or resources prepare their proposals um, could be one very, um, you know, useful way of encouraging those types of things um, and just making it very clear that we're open to these more complex studies, as you mentioned. Um, it, it's just about getting a solid proposal that considers the things that a lot of people don't realize about the PSA, because unless you've done a study, and or help organize a study, you don't know what the challenges would actually be to plan for them. So there's really a gap, I think, in knowledge that could be preventing people from proposing things. Nadia? Uh, yeah, I, I think along the same lines, and I think, uh, um, I, I think um, there was a, um, Lisa put put in a comment uh, as well. What are the things that um, that this committee or the PSA in general can do to encourage people from um, underrepresented or like non weird or un developing countries? I don't know what we're using anymore. Um, um, like for example, I'm from Mexico, and I one of the things that I have seen is that most of the studies are coming either from Europe or from, from the States. So what kinds of things could be done uh, to encourage uh, researchers or uh, what kinds of support um, can be provided uh, so that research, uh, researchers in Mexico or um, um, Kenya or I don't know, Philippines would want to do it and feel uh, supported uh, to, to try to do it. I mean, I think as Lisa mentioned, some sort of mentorship around that or offering that as a service or possibility from PSA insiders could be one approach. Um, another thing I was thinking, and this is all very dependent upon um, kind of how the implementation of the John Templeton Foundation grant goes, but having a call specific to researchers from underrepresented areas um, could be one really cool way to just very explicitly require as well as encourage um, people to, and, and of course, if we do that, then having some sort of maybe like incubator style way to um, like propose a proposal and develop it with help from PSA insiders would be a nice way to ensure that that actually happened um, rather than just kind of hoping for the best and putting it out there. Um, so I have some ideas, but it really kind of depends on the um, when the next call is and if we do have additional calls outside of the JTF specific calls that we're planning sometime in the next year. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much and I'll move on to the, the next people. Um, I appreciate you and I, I can definitely set up um, and uh, make this conversation continue um, on Slack or something like that. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I think uh, there are no other questions. So yeah, it's the turn of the PSA Ethics Committee. So Gary, feel free to share the slides and then you're welcome to open okay. the session. Okay, thank you, Garrett. Um, so good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're located, and it's good to see you all today. 
Um, I am representing the PSA Ethics Committee along with quite a few of the other members who are here. And I'm just gonna get it started before I turn this over to our members. So the Ethics Committee, Garrett, if you, it's okay, you can go to the next slide. Okay, and I would also just wanted to thank uh, Biana for putting this presentation, coordinating this, putting this PowerPoint together as well. Um, this is the work of her efforts. So I am Dana Bassnight-Brown. I am one of the associate directors at the PSA. And uh, according to, with our new leadership, with Nick coming in uh, this summer, he has sort of coordinated a liaison of sorts to work with various committees. And so he has uh, assigned me to work alongside the ethics committee. So that is sort of the role I am playing. Uh, the committee is led by Biana and uh, Mike, and they are both doing an excellent job leading a very active uh, committee, which it's been a lot of fun to work with them because they're every, all the members are quite engaged. So. I'm just serving in that role in terms of attending their meetings, um, helping with decision making processes and communicating questions or issues um, to associate directors or the director if the need be. Uh, you can see here, as I mentioned, our two assistant directors who are really uh, leading these efforts and then our standing committee members, um, Kim Garrett and Anna. And some of the roles are listed on the right side. Um, another thing I just wanted to sort of bring attention to with this committee, which I think is a nice advantage, is that all of the committee members here are placed in different parts around the world and they all bring a lot of expertise in terms of how ethical processes might differ in different locations. And so that is something I've appreciated a lot, especially from some of the individuals in the EU, because we all know that various IRB or ethical processes or things coming from the government can be very different in North America, EU, Africa, and so forth. And I really appreciate that we have individuals with expertise on how those things are done in different parts of the world. I think that is a big advent, you know, advantage um, of having committee members here. Um, another thing I just wanted to I think mention as well in terms of the role of this committee. So this committee is of course working with other committees. I know with some of the changes in leadership to um, Biana stepping into as her assistant director role, they're quite eager to work closely with other committees if there are things that they can be doing to sort of represent ethics or perhaps like Kathleen just presented on study selection it's possible there could be a role for ethics to be engaged in study selection in some way if we're working with specialized populations. Those populations could be viewed or treated very differently in different countries. So I think another thing for us to just think about is how could this committee help the committees that you are all working with? Um, because this group specifically is very eager to assist with those processes if they can. Um, and then I think the one final thing before I turn this over to Biano, who will take you through some of the processes of the committee, is just to think through and recognize um, how the ethical processes could be different in different parts of the world. Because we are such a large, we're growing and we're such a large group now. And research ethics has been a heavy interest of mine for a long time. But one challenge I often encounter is that Sometimes when people are used to how IRB or certain processes happen in their country, they don't always recognize it could be a very different process. I'm based in Kenya. It's very, very different here in terms of how that is done. And a lot of those regulations come from the government. So just because like as a PSA group, we might feel like, well, this isn't efficient or why do we have to get an entirely new IRB when we have them for all these other institutions? And I can understand and agree with that. But for some of us in certain parts of the world, we're constrained by the government protocols on IRB. Um, that's my situation, for example. And so you can't always, the PSA can't come in and change the government's <laughs> regulations. So it's just something I encounter a lot and just want to raise attention to in terms of having us all be aware of some of those sort of restraints that some of our colleagues might have depending on where they're conducting their research. 
So I will turn this over to Bianna, our assistant director, and she will uh, walk you through some of the ethical processes for each project they, they take on. Thank you, Dana. And uh, first of all, let me tell you that I'm really happy to be here uh, because some of the people that inspired me to first uh, apply for the, the position of assistant director are actually here. And now I'm going, and now one of them will recognize herself immediately because I used her template from uh, her study as a template for our workflow process. And her, this is Hannah and I can share her study now with all of you. All of you are very familiar with it, but just in case you need, uh, oh, I'm, I, I sent it to get it, sorry. Um, uh, just in case you need uh, to have a more detailed insight on the procedure uh, within a life cycle of one research project, then you can refer to this paper. What we did here is that we took this uh, uh, workflow and just tried to analyze it where we, uh, the ethics com committee come into play in each of the four important stages. And we were doing this uh, with the one goal in mind. First of all, we wanted to have a clear understanding to clarify our roles and responsibilities within research projects. So how the current state of uh, affairs are unfolding at, at present. As soon as we know how the things are uh, organized within PSA, at least for me, and this was a, like a, a training exercise for me because I'm the newest member, even though one, I'm one of the assistant directors at this committee, I would be able to think uh, about the future plans and how to address the challenges. So, uh, and this was uh, part of what our activities that were uh, coordinated in order to create a document, a policy document, and also I will share a clean version of this document. I must let you know that this is not the uh, may, may not be the uh, final version of the document, but it will give you pretty much good understanding on our policies and our roles and responsibilities, especially within a framework of one research project. So to go back to this slide, uh, as you can see, we uh, identified several places where we come into play and all of them, our roles and responsibilities are activated in uh, response to some cues, some actions. For example, in, in phase one, as soon as we are contacted by study selection committee, uh, that there is a study proposal that uh, passed the initial feasibility check and needs to uh, go uh, uh, under a more tariff uh, feasibility check, including uh, ethics feasibility check, then uh, we are invited. And then one of our uh, members uh, is assigned to be sort of ethics evaluator uh, in order to uh, see, uh, to assess some basic uh, feasibility criteria. For example, whether the collaborators are skilled enough, whether the, the, this, what are the ethical implications of the study design, is there a, an informed consent included? Uh, uh, how are uh, the researchers going to deal with ethical issues? There is a, actually a form for this and people uh, and uh, the ethics evaluators are required, get it. You can go back to the slide, <laughs> but we, leave, we can leave people to uh, visit the document by on their own will and free time. Uh, so this, this is in relation to phase one. Once the study is selected, then uh, phase one begins and we have several roles to play and we are kind of should be quite involved. So that's why we decided we should include at least uh, two people. One of them like principal ethics monitor, we called them. We called him or her and the other is secondary ethics monitor. The first one is going to be the uh, the the one that is going to uh, secure unbiased regards. So he or her, uh, her is not expected to be involved in the study, uh, only to evaluate the study, while the second can have more engaged regard. But uh, I'm, uh, maybe you can see that I'm always referring to some hierarchy. Even the roles were assigned like in a Christmas tree, like in some hierarchical model. 
But in fact, I must stress and highlight that most of us are very equal. <laughs> And uh, uh, these are often uh, frequently discussed issues. For example, we were thinking whether we should have primary and secondary assistant director in accordance with some of the proposals that come from PSA leads, but then we decided we should have more equal say. And uh, uh, this is the case also with the primary and secondary ethics monitor for the time being. Uh, so uh, anyhow, uh, within the second phase, we are usually uh, assessing uh, uh, several criteria. First of all, um, uh, whether the data is in accordance with the uh, health issues. Uh, so it, does it pose a minimal health risk for the participants? Uh, or or is, does it exceed a, a minimal health risk? For the participants, then if the data is too revealing, uh, uh, disclosing some personal information, so data issues and geographical issues, whether the study can be implemented in diverse uh, regions of the world. Of course, this is very roughly speaking. I know that I'm taking too much time. So I will now briefly rush through the phase three and four. In any case, in phase two, we are also, uh, should be responsible for to make sure that the IRBs are in place, uh, uh, not only for, from the study leads, but also from uh, later on from all participating laboratories. Uh, in study, uh, in phase three, we are checking the data for any disclosing information. I mean, maybe this is also a part of the uh, HANAS committee, but we are uh, here to help. We, uh, as uh, Dana mentioned, we are always eager to uh, uh, lend a helping hand, but uh, in any case, we are checking the information pack for completeness, study materials for possible issues. Again, uh, check whether the collected uh, uh, personal information is day identified and some addition, additional aspects uh, if needed. And then or in phase uh, four, during the analysis and dissemination, we are also safeguarding the ethical procedure before the data is officially released. So this is in very brief, even though I took too much of my time, uh, explanation of the workflow of activities within our life cycle of a project in which we uh, try to uh, contribute in a meaningful way for the PSA community. So Gary, over to you now. Thanks. Thank you. So now comes the surprise whether it works or not. But let's see whether you can hear anything at all. Um, presumably you can't. Can you hear? No. <laughs> we, we didn't test this. If you have a mic, you can maybe bring it closer, or I don't know. So Otherwise, maybe... just share the YouTube link. You can't hear, uh, but it doesn't matter. It's uh, uh, my turn now to uh, compliment what Dana and Biljana have said. And it's not only that we support the PSA in a more background uh, fashion, we also think uh, long term. And that means um, we have discussed over the last months to actually create an ethics survey for all PSA members to understand uh, how actually the variability is across different um, yeah, PSA labs across the world. So in terms of the process, the costs, how long it takes them, what they count as sensitive and uh, risk issues. So when can they use exemptions and so on? It differs already between the few countries that we represent, um, but it would be nice to uh, get a um, broader uh, and also explicit meaning on paper um, view of that. Um, we will um, send this out by using the Canvas system that PSA has switched to. Um, can't promise the exact date, but we aim before Christmas. And the results will actually help us to uh, give a template of a kind of universal um, IRB form that might be particularly helpful for those who are not running their own lab, but maybe most or PhD students that, that join a PSA project and then can file it. Um, 
But of course, we will also share the survey findings with uh, our PSA members um, that may then inform the section committee. And as some may remember, there was a call from the Swiss Open Psychology Journal for challenges uh, of, uh, yeah, uh, multi-lab or, um, yeah, large scale studies. And we thought that um, this was an call, um, a relevant call. As um, Ilana uh, already um, mentioned, um, we uh, have uh, the ethics policies as a um, not yet finalized um, doc uh, document in the sense of it has not uh, been voted by all PSA members. Um, you will soon hear about uh, the ethics survey. And last but not least, uh, very important, we will actually open for call for new members. Um, I think uh, Biana can and Dana can jump in there. But the idea is also maybe to uh, um, enlarge um, the uh, uh, standing members from so far three to maybe five that we really represent um, more the diversity in the PSA. So someone from Africa, Asia, South America, highly desired. And yeah, if you're interested in our work, please uh, switch on uh, the Slack channel ethic committee. Now we are taking questions. Yeah, we have also Anna with us today. In, uh, so there are four out of six members present here today in case you want to ask some questions. Uh, as regards the new call, yes, it should be released around the beginning of the next year. I was analyzing other committees and I can see that many of them have many more standing committee members. This is the least number of standing committee members that we have at the moment. But we decided we should close some ongoing activities, just not in order to confu create confusion and then uh, open the floor to, as Gerrit mentioned, as many different people from many different countries as possible, I mean, within a reasonable <laughs> limit. Um, that's one thing I, I want to mention. And also I know that I, I was very inspired by Nick uh, opening uh, uh, lecture. And among other things he mentioned uh, it, many ethical challenges that are po uh, posed on PSA and victim science. And uh, most of them are actually synthesized, summarized in his paper. And I can also share this with you. And I know that, uh, I mean, uh, we, we have a long uh, path ahead of us. One of them is probably to standardize the IRB for those uh, uh, universities and participating labs that don't have IRB, any uh, type of templated place, at least we can offer some possibility because we cannot play a, a role, important role for those countries as Dana mentioned that already have rules, regulations and governments uh, setting the IRB standards and everything. But we can at least facilitate the procedure in that regard. So the survey is the first step just having an overview on all the varieties of IRBs that exist. And in this regard, I should thank Lisa, especially because uh, she put us in touch with other researcher, that is uh, Daniel Likens, who's working uh, on this uh, topic as well. So we are working with, with them. They have provided very valuable insight on the survey. And now we are in the process, Lisa, of finalizing the survey. <laughs> Finally, we are completing the survey, so it will be released. So we will be contacting probably the leads in order to find ways to distribute this survey within our network. Sorry if I took too much of your time. But I'm open for any question whatsoever. Yes, you have a memory from this talk. Okay, I'm very grateful to you, <laughs> Gary, for these special effects. She was supposed to make these tilted letters uh, at the end, but 
Um, yeah, sorry, I have a, a review to submit today as well. Okay. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Next time, I promise. So if there are no questions, maybe we can proceed with the other committees. Uh, next speaker is uh, Hannah from the PSA Project Monitoring Committee. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, let me just make sure I get my screen all set up. Um, it's nice to see a lot of people. There are some people. I have emailed almost everyone, <laughs> at least that's visible here, but I haven't necessarily met everyone. Biliana, I don't know that we've been in the same Zoom room, but it's nice to see you. Um, Okay, so let me share my screen. So a lot of people, because of the role of a project monitor, I think a lot of people have at least some sense of what we do. Um, can everyone see just the main, the main slides and not presenter view or my, my email or anything like that? Okay. Um, so uh, I wanted to use this presentation to talk a little bit about how the role has sort of changed over time and some of the challenges that we've had and also talk a little bit about the Canvas system that others have mentioned and sort of why we're doing that and why we involved the website at one point and just sort of the thinking that went behind some of the changes that people may or may not be aware of. Um, so just as a brief introduction, I'm Hannah Moschance. I'm a, a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the US. Um, until yesterday, actually, I was the assistant director of project monitoring from the beginning of the PSA. I am no longer the assistant director. So it's, this is sort of like a nice end cap of my um, experience in this role and working a lot on project monitoring. And that, that I'm just, you know, I have been served this role for a long time. I want to give someone else the opportunity to be involved and make decisions, um, but I'm not leaving the PSA or anything. I'll still be around. Um, so uh, I'm going to start by describing sort of the original conceived role of the project monitor. And um, then I'll talk about some of the challenges that came with that role and then some of the changes that we implemented as a result. So originally, this role was actually called project manager, as I'm sure some of you will remember. And that's sort of a term from more um, industry settings that has a lot of sort of that basically the it involves a little bit more of um, administrative responsibility um, just in the the name alone so and that sort of matches with how we conceived of the original role so we sort of thought well in these big collaborative projects there's this risk that things are going to fall through the cracks so how are we going to make sure that with you know lead authors can be anyone they may not have they may not even know our policies. Like, how can we make sure that all the projects do what we say they're going to do? Well, we'll invent a role that makes sure that that happens. So we had this role. The idea was this person is just going to make sure that every single project doesn't go catastrophically wrong and that we can kind of check all the boxes for all of these policies. Um, and, you know, I've listed the policies here. And these were sort of the main the main focus of the original kind of project managers. Um, in practice, what this meant was like a crazily broad variety of tasks and responsibilities that de depended almost entirely on who the lead team was. So, you know, some lead teams are, are PSA folks who are there from the beginning and know so much about it and have really strong ideas and commitment to our policies. Others, you know, don't even know what the policies are. Maybe don't maybe are in support of the policies, but just don't have the skills to make sure that our data are stored in um, in ways that can be accessible and machine readable and all those other wonderful things. Um, also, practically, what ended up happening was that the PM, as I'll call it, was really the communicator with the larger author group. So they ended up organizing all the people involved in the project, making sure that everyone knew what was happening, updating them, um, you know, kind of managing lists of people and doing a lot of the tracking activities that you know, are required just to actually implement these studies. Um, and that was just basically a ton of work. So the main challenge was these are volunteer positions. So that amount of work makes sense for someone who is being paid full time, but for someone that's just volunteering, often it, it sort of happens that many of the early project monitors were graduate students or you know, recently graduated students. Um, and that's just like a lot of work for, for one person to do who has a bunch of other responsibilities. Um, we also kind of inadvertently created this role where there was like a mismatch between how much responsibility someone had and the power they had to actually get those things to happen. So, you know, you can say, 
I'm responsible for making sure this happens. But if you're talking with lead, lead authors who by far outrank you in the, the sort of traditional academic hierarchies, a graduate student is not going to mandate anything of people with tenure, you know, at so and so university, that's just not going to happen. Um, and so, you know, the what ended up happening was people in this role would sort of um, be in this really difficult position to navigate. Um, it's really stressful. Uh, there was also often miscommunications of the role with lead author teams where some lead authors thought, okay, I, it's my, I'm the ideas person and you're the implementer. And that just isn't how, how it can work. It's just too much work to implement these projects for one person, especially again, someone who maybe hasn't had a bunch of experience, you know, managing big groups of people in a formal capacity. Um, and the other, another kind of tricky thing about this role, and this will sort of lead into the needs assessment. So when this role predates the needs assessment, and we really instigated the creation of that, or were very much in support of it. Um, and a lot of things came together to create the needs assessment process. But basically, we ended, the PM is in this position to identify, but like kind of not do anything about really big issues. So the, the PM can kind of ring the alarm bell to be like, oh, actually, it turns out that we haven't been tracking these things well by the time we get to stage two submission, or, oh, the lead team decides they wanna change the study design in ways that are actually really important and kind of require re-review and maybe wouldn't have gotten accepted initially. Um, but again, this person can't really do much besides ring alarm bells. My cat is like immediately in front of my screen, so. Um, and let's see, some other things, just like authorship disputes where, okay, it turns out the lead team didn't actually read the collaboration agreement and they, they don't like the, the authorship order, but it's the stage two submission. So um, what do you do about that? Just really difficult positions that, again, someone is often not in a good kind of power role or stage in their career to handle well. It's just stressful. Um, so we've done a lot of things to kind of shift that, but mostly at the level of the entire PSA, this role is so central to how the PSA functions and kind of um, is the product of, of everything in the PSA. And so a lot of the changes that made sense for other committees too have made this role much easier. So what we did to focus just on the project monitor position is we changed the name kind of just to signal this person isn't actually responsible for managing the entire project. Um, really, they're just sort of helpers or support. We also added some other two other things that uh, the project monitors support lead authors in doing, and we kind of try to make lead authors aware of these things. Is that there's there's now a code of conduct to prevent any kind of like, you know, uh, inappropriate kind of power infused communication. So in no situation can the lead authors um, mandate that the PM do anything for them. Um, and this also kind of goes along with like working collaboratively. Like we need to have mutual respect, and that's something that within the PSA, we, we really do. And um, like Biliana was saying about the ethics committee, I think that's true for the committee, for the PSA as a whole, where we often don't pay attention to people's credentials. We treat people with respect and as peers and collaborators. That is not always the case with people that are coming in to lead these studies and they might have a really, um, you know, they might see things really differently in, in ways that affect how they treat their colleagues. Um, and then again, through the needs assessment, we've really tried to spread out this work so that we can identify, okay, there's someone from the ethics committee who's, who's going to be our consultant when the lead team that wants to change the design in ways that we, that probably have ethics implications for different places. Like how, you know, there's, there's all of these like um, difficult to anticipate implications of doing these large collaborative projects as, as all of you know. Um, and so the needs assessment kind of just makes explicit who is responsible for what so that it doesn't all just fall on the PM. And then we also have explicit conversations about what the PM is going to do. Maybe the PM will send out all the emails for the project, but maybe the lead team can do that, or maybe, and maybe the, the PM really doesn't like doing that, so they don't have to. Um, and this, this also kind of predates the assignment of a specific PM so that we can find the right person. So um, there's a lot of kind of little changes in addition, but these are sort of the big broad strokes changes. I also want to briefly talk about changes in tools and infrastructure. So there's so many ways to do this. Initially, we kind of just started with like basically Google Sheets and Google Forms and like, okay, it's time to collect authorship information or time to understand where people are at with their, you know, ethics approval. We'll just send out a new form. And then we have all these different Google Sheets and that felt kind of inefficient. As In some ways, it's very simple and clear, but in other ways, it's kind of inefficient and feels silly because we all have like we, we have slightly more sophisticated technology at our disposal. So we moved to this website system, which 
the idea was really to centralize this information so we don't have to constantly ask everyone, hey, what, what institution are you at unless they're moving um, and sort of reduce the number of forms people had to fill out. You know, it turned out that with, from the role, from the view of the PM, like we tried to use the website for the COVID rapid project. And it was just really messy actually. And I don't know that, it, I think in some ways it might've been better to just send out a bunch of Google forms, but there's, these projects are really hard to keep track of. Um, and so no matter how you do it, it's gonna be a little bit messy and annoying. Um, both Google Sheets and the website were not perfect. Canvas, I'm really excited about because the issues with Google Sheets and website is I think that it feels like from both ends in some ways, there's not a lot of like autonomy and control or like transparency about what's happening. So like if someone was like, I need to update my institutional affiliation, I want to do that. Um, if I could do that independently, I would. And I don't wanna bother anyone else to have to do this, but actually with the website, for example, um, there is a clear way to do that, but it's not totally intuitive. And so anyway, I'm hoping that Canvas will be easier, both from like the perspective of collaborating labs and from the perspective of the people who need to like access that information to make authorship lists and things like that. Um, I will also just say this is sort of part of tools and infrastructure, unlike a lot of other, uh, oh, I'm aware of the time, I'm a little bit over, but unlike a lot of other committees, which work really, their work is really fundamentally collaborative, like study selection, that's, decisions are made on the basis of the group. We are kind of like independent people that kind of bring our, our heads together to talk about what's, what's going on and get feedback, but we don't really like operate as a group per se. So we have these meetings, but really the primary work of, the, of a project monitor is between the project monitor and the lead team um, or between the project monitor and like the big collaborative group of co-authors. So we do have these regular meetings and that is sort of part of our infrastructure, but, um, but we also rely on a lot of these tools and stuff. So, okay, that's, that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I know that um, I'm over time though, so I don't wanna uh, steal time from anyone else. But if anyone has a question, I'd be happy to answer it now, or we could hold it to the very end just to make sure that we have enough time for all the presentations. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. She loves being near me when I'm talking on Zoom. <laughs> Uh, Dana. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I just wanted to take a very quick moment and thank you so much for everything you've done. I know you're not leaving the PSA um, and you'll still be engaged, but truly like since the inception of the PSA, you've played a huge role. You've been immensely valuable. So just sort of wanted to publicly, so you don't just sort of leave your position and someone new comes in, but just thank you for like you've dedicated hours and hours with project management as well as working with the committee. So just want to thank you for all of that. Oh, thank you, Dana and everyone else uh, communicating support in various ways. I appreciate It's that. huge and tackling the COVID projects. That was not easy. Yeah, we could have a whole other presentation about that. <laughs> but I, yeah, just thank you so much because you've been here since the beginning and have really helped move the PSA forward, so. Thanks, I appreciate that. That's no question for Anna. I would uh, move on to Miguel. All right, just a minute. Uh... All right, please tell me you're not seeing my presentation view. All We're good? Not. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Miguel Salan, Assistant Director of the Community Building and Network Expansion Committee. And it's my pleasure tonight to speak on behalf of the committee to introduce ourselves, what we do, and what we plan to do after the conference. So one of the greatest strengths of the PSA, of course, lies not only in our output, in our multi-country output, in our big team science processes, but really in the members themselves, in the community of passionate people um, wanting to improve the field. So at the committee, uh, what we do in general, our activities revolve around community engagement or nurturing or building, a better, building better within network ties, community expansion, 
community assessment, and other exciting projects. So for example, for community engagement, um, everyone will be a little familiar with this. Hopefully we have our monthly coffee socials on Zoom or GatherTown where members across the network, both new and old um, and across the globe, get to meet in an informal space and just hang out um, and get to know each other better. And it's been really amazing to see what kind of connections arise from these kinds of spaces. So if you guys haven't been to a coffee social yet, here is Nick in a mug in a coffee. Um, this is a gentle invitation for, for you to join. Uh, this is usually led by Savannah or Nadia and me. And there are also a community energizer Slack threads um, that are like coffee socials, but are in written form. So you get to see the breadth of the perspective of a community across a number of topics, for example, on research failures, on why they stay in the reform movement, and so on. And these energizer threads lately have been picked up by Peter Malik. And then we also launched the welcome channel, which is the brainchild of Aishwara Ayer, which is a space for new members to both introduce themselves and as a space where they can ask questions as they start to navigate the PSA environment. And of course, we have this amazing conference today, um, which is also a CBNX supported event along with the PSA Con 2021 task force. But clearly, aside from community building and community engagement, a big thrust of the community uh, of the committee is on community expansion particularly to developing countries across the world that are currently not represented well in our network. We see, for example, in the PSA map, both last year and this year, uh, immediately we can see the regions that are not represented well in the network. Although, of course, a quick note that this current map shows around 1,200 members, but actually we have 2,000 members signed in our database. So in fact, uh, this map is an undercount and we don't know where the 800 um, members currently reside. And it's still, you know, uh, what constitutes a PSA member or who is a PSA member is still an active issue that I believe Nick and Savannah and the team will um, try to iron out hopefully uh, sooner or later as we move to Canvas. Of course, the main goal uh, is to greenify this and to achieve the PSA's founding ambition. So to, do, to start with this, what we did as a committee was to push a really purposive systematic recruitment, which was headed by Ashura Ayer, Bastian Karius, and me, first creating a database of scholars from developing uh, regions. The initial search was of researchers affiliated with a psychology degree program in the top two to three universities in each country and published authors in Scopus journals. This is obviously an imperfect way to do it, but we believe that it is a good first step. Uh, and then we just cold emailed contacts in the database, translated to eight lingua franca, the eight most spoken languages in the world. Uh, and then we introduced ourselves, what they stand to benefit if they join, how they can contribute. And we also created a sort of infographic actually. So if people want to reach out to others, they can use this, although some of the project information would already be outdated. Uh, so this approach in principle should have attacked both issues of awareness and access. First, do people from developing countries even know about the PSA? And if they knew about it, they might not have felt that it was accessible to join. So we contact more than 1,000 individuals from these all different world regions, developing world regions and countries. So we send more than 1,000 emails. Um, and can anyone guess our engagement rate? How many actually did sign up from all of these 1,000 emails uh, and more that we um, had to send? Well, the estimate is around a 10% engagement rate. So, uh, for example, for, one thousand, for every 100 emails that we, we sent, we would have around 10 um, who would uh, sign up. Although, of course, we can't discount that it may have other benefits, even if they didn't sign up. It could have raised familiarity and awareness, which would have made further recruitment strategies easier and more effective. And again, not to discount, because each voice from a developing scholar that we add to the network is important. And in fact, if you read the emails of, of those who have responded, they have been very warm, they were very interested. In fact, uh, I was just invited to give a talk to around 600 students in North Macedonia in November. So this is a good start. However, when we look at our 10% engagement rate, actually we really shouldn't be surprised. 
we know the various difficulties of the people in a uh, developing majority world, you know, previously colonized countries, because even the language barrier is an issue. If you received an invitation email in Chinese, I don't think that would be very appealing to you too. Although, of course, we translated it to across like eight uh, different language frameworks, again, just the familiarity to English is already a marker. And secondly, we're also hearing for some that they're reserved about joining because they feel like the current projects are too detached uh, from their cultural context or doesn't speak to urgent national issues. Of course, um, many other different difficulties, logistical, infrastructural support, funding, et cetera. Uh, but of course, we know that this is important. We know that the involvement of, um, of these people is central to good science and to the PSA's founding ambition. So we are continuing. We've tried out one way, and now we're mapping out other ways to continue this initiative, including just continued following up. If they you know, didn't engage in the first time, let's try again. Um, but I'm more excited actually about the one-on-one -on -one relationship building with small Eastern countries with no PSA presence yet and really have a personal connection. And I'm currently doing this with uh, Arab psychologists. And I believe one thing that will really draw these individuals as we saw from the COVID project, that, because it was relevant to them, one thing that I believe will really draw these individuals from developing countries is if there's a proof of concept or a project that would show big team science working for them or would show clear benefits to already precarious, not only precarious researchers, but precarious, you know, um, uh, potential participants in the data pools, uh, in the sample pools. So, and I believe that this is central. I believe that the greatest intellectual and moral challenges of big, uh, moral challenge of big team science today is how it can better serve the brilliance of disenfranchised people of the world. So theory building and multiverse explorations, yes. Experiments and basic research, yes. I believe that all of these really is for a more ambitious and more human project. To echo Nick, if we care about our science, we need to care about where our science takes place. And as, our Patrick, as Patrick Forsher will discuss in an upcoming article, this isn't just a moral challenge. The long-term viability of the field and of big team science depends on this. So if these issues there is something in you, please do come join us. Um, the CBNEC is an awesome crew. Uh, the important work that the committee is doing wouldn't be possible without these individuals in no particular order. For example, we have Santana, all around awesome person, lead organizer of the PSA one, of the coffee socials, of the newsletter of the website. It's generally the backbone of the PSA. Um, here she is with her cat. Um, Here's Aish, she's the lead for the recruitment drive. She brings so much insight to the committee. Um, if you're currently, she's currently looking for a PhD uh, in environmental psych. So if any in the audience knows any leads, please do um, uh, send her a quick head up. She is also a cat person. Here is, I believe everyone would be familiar with Bastian, has brought so much energy to the PSA in general and in the committee in particular has been foundational to the recruitment drive. And if you saw the capacity report last year that was headed by Bastien, here he is with his dogs. This is me with a dog who had been trying to get my attention the whole time I was speaking. Uh, Adeyumi, a director of Menelabs Africa and Menelabs Crip, and again, very active, considered member of the committee. Here he is with his pet. <laughs> Um, and uh, here's Crystal, who has been with the committee from the very start and has put her constant support in the current initiatives, even despite the big changes in her life, um, with a cat in her back now. Peter Malik, resident father of the committee, with his son pictured here, currently handling the stack engagement thread and very supportive member of the committee. Natalia Dutra with her daughter. Her daughter also attends our meetings, much to everyone's appreciation. She is co-assistant director of the committee. Nadia Parral, she serves as a regional coordinator for the Latin America recruitment, also the PSA Quant Task Force, and generally a kick as a researcher and CBNEC member. Here she is with her daughter. Her daughter also features in our meetings sometimes. Martin Vasilev with us, handling the coordination of the Hub Initiative. Uh, that's not his baby, that is him literally as a baby. Um, and aside from the awesome crew, um, why join us? We have a very exciting roster of projects for the next month. Our recruitment um, is ongoing. Um, the capacity report will start on January. Not only operational capacity, but how and why do people join the PSA? Like, why did they join at the start? Why are they still staying? 
um, do these multi-country uh, papers actually benefit them in any way and so on. We don't want just operational capacity, but these sorts of motivation dynamics that will really allow us to better understand um, um, you know, the leeway of our next initiative. The hub, which is a more democratic, hopefully like a more democratic, you know, a more accessible tapping of expertise. We have such a deep pool of expertise in the network, um, but it's currently not very easy to, you know, tap them uh, for their expertise. So this hopefully would, would be an easier way to, to have peer reviewers or to have collaborators or to have, you know, critiques in your own work. Uh, headed by Erin. Kathleen is here. She's part of the uh, founding task force of the hub as well. He has a rare population with Trust will also be a CV neck um, um, supported uh, event at the PSA regional hubs as well and promoting culture specific and cultural sensitive methods with their savvy. For his capacity building, we don't just want the developing researchers to join the network and we tell them, you know, um, uh, do good science, but in environments that are very hard to do, you know, good science, um, we, we, again, without support or without funding. Uh, and we really want to have the PSA's internship program launch uh, at least we start on January. Other wish list projects that we don't have manpower for, but have been brought up um, again and again, sometimes um, uh, in the past meetings, PSA podcast, the PSA merch store, a monthly newsletter like Spotlight and International Psychological Science, Committee Town Hall and all of that. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge as well the friends of the committee who have helped us throughout our initiatives in the past year in one form or another. And uh, that is the committee. Thank you so much. If anybody in the audience would like to join us, please either uh, DM me in Slack or email me. Thank you, everyone. Any questions? Any question for Miguel? Hannah? Yeah, this is, in part, I just want to say thank you so much for all this work. This is incredible. I was not aware of all of, all of these efforts. Um, and not by you and many other people. It's, it's really important and wonderful. Um, so I'm, as I mentioned, I'm not, in, I'm not uh, leading the PM committee anymore. But is there something like, are you wishing for different kinds of support from other committees, or what? What can other committees do to support? Should we join as individuals, um, or can we like kind of more formally collaborate among the committees? Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, right. Thank you for that. Uh, hi, thanks, Anna. Uh, one thing that might help, um, uh, there's no concrete way yet. Of course, we can't, you know, I mean, ad ideally more manpower is lovely. Anybody who wants to volunteer is great, uh, would be great. But there's also this idea of generally more support for possibly um, region specific research that wouldn't be deployed in a whole network, maybe like just like researching in like Latin America or particular region using um, and you know the ideas of like multi uh, cross indigenous approach rather than the cross cultural approach so currently a more and you said this as well uh, a while ago I believe that you know a more more diverse kind of project kit than we currently have uh, would be would be great to really draw in the people from these different regions as well so I think this ties in as well with what uh, with what Lisa was saying a while ago when we do those kinds of project workshops. That if there is already support for these kinds of diverse projects, uh, I think that would help uh, middle term to long term as well. Garrett, what do you mean? Is that is that a question for me about the quota approach? Well, you know, I just put it out because it's always a discussion whether it helps or not. But in the starting phase, my impression is that that it helps. But uh, of course, I haven't 
done the theorist work that there's kind of a quota. So the PSA says so and so many percentage need to be from uh, underrepresented countries in certain positions because it's then the visibility. So if you see that really, oh, someone from this country is uh, an assistant uh, director, uh, let's say from Africa or so on, then uh, it, it's, uh, I think it's not any longer that you see, oh, they are anyway just, well, Americans. <laughs> As has been alluded before, we, we have, uh, well, we are still biased. I mean, in terms of who, uh, it's not only contributing, but it's also deciding. Um, so having kind of leadership uh, roles. I mean, it's very democratic, the PSA, but you still have in the, if you just look at the list of, uh, so the, the uh, associate and assistant uh, directors, um, it's, uh, I don't see many from Asia, South Africa or uh, South America or Africa. So uh, I know they're also not representing the, the, that many labs, but um, if I would uh, enter, uh, visit the website uh, from, I don't know, give me a country, Colombia. Um, yeah, I, I would to some extent also be a bit put off. I say, well, how can I actually make a, an impact? Um, so, I, I don't know. I, I'm just putting this out that all what we are doing, uh, I know some have also on Twitter uh, issued their quite their voice, um, but I'm just putting it out whether the PSA reserves some spots. I mean, that's what our university is doing for the indigenous people. We have a quota for them here. And if they are not fulfilling it, then yes, it gets uh, the, the non-indigenous people get the study places, but they have a protected quota. Um, so I'm, I'm just putting it out. Not necessarily for your committee. I, I meant overall the, the PSA uh, as a, all committees, so to say. Natalia. Yeah. Hi, is it, is it working? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so I I just wanted to say something quick in relation to what Garrett said, uh, and also something that Miguel uh, and other people, Miguel and I, and before that, Chris and I, and other people from PSC are very concerned about, and we are we always have discussions about how to include other researchers uh, from uh, developing countries or low and middle income countries, or even just what you call non weird places. Uh, they don't necessarily overlap, and uh, something that I think that it's a purely anecdotal. Uh, my bias perception is is that people from other places feel more comfortable when they have some sort of liaison or some sort of people that they know, uh, and then they feel more comfortable to join. So in, in my case, that happened. So I have a couple of colleagues that got they joined. But they still like sort of look as I told Miguel that I, I put a commitment to uh, bring uh, one or two people to work. So these five vacancy spots, I hope one, at least two of them are from, I mean, one of them or two are from Brazil, hopefully. But uh, it, it works better when you have this sort of contact. And I don't know in other places, but in Brazil, Brazil, of course, we are amidst a, a huge economic crisis right now, huge and political crisis. But uh, economic and political, but um, when we, you insist and invite them and say, oh, it would be great if you would be there, then people feel more comfortable in joining. Otherwise, they just feel like, I don't know if I should go. I don't know if I, if I feel it's the place for me to be. Uh, it has a lot of reasons why that happened. People are busy, people are shy, people are uncomfortable in speaking English. Uh, so something that I've been talking a lot to other colleagues about PSA is that is a a great place for people with different accents. So it's it's from from far from afar. Considering other places that I've been, it's one of the best best places for people to express themselves in English and don't feel like they are being judged by that. Um, so I don't know. I just feel like perhaps we could invest more in that idea of having uh, key people in some uh, regions or even countries 
where they will work as some sort of liaison person uh, to uh, the community there. It's a bit, well, of course, there, there, are, there are risks to that, but um, uh, it's the thing that has been sort of working for me when I, when I do stuff. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Natalia, because I think that that's one question we've been challenged with in leadership is that um, even like looking at recent applications to fill the few roles for assistant director, when we looked at people who self nominated or were nominated by others, um, it was all once again, Americans or North um, or Europeans, North Americans or Europeans. And so that's a challenging situation because you're, you're you're maybe wanting to diversify and then you're looking at who put names forward or applications and it's once again from the same regions and so obviously like i recognize there's much more long-standing like pervasive reasons why whether it's individuals like you feel shy to to self-nominate or maybe that's not something um that they do as much as in their culture. Maybe they don't know what that position actually entails. So they're unsure to put their name forward. So they're, and also please feel free, even if you wanna like um, PM me, like reasons why or things like that. I would personally love to just be learning more of what are some of the issues that are causing people from underrepresented areas to be less likely to put their names forward. But this is something that we do constantly sort of see that when we look to fill these positions, it's once again, um, even if we want to have a more diverse group, the applicants aren't there. So we recognize that that is, yeah, a much more pervasive, bigger issue. And so helping us, especially this committee, which I do think um, the network building committee is one of the more geographically diverse than some of the others. And so you're all like very well positioned and have the expertise, I think, to help us figure out how we can address some of those issues. But I know that that's come up quite a bit over the years in trying to like fill some of those positions too. So, but I just really appreciate what you said, Natalia, that maybe a liaison in those different areas is what would help people feel more confident um, to approach that person. And then that person could maybe nominate that individual. So something like that. So I just find that very helpful. So thank you. Yeah, okay. Cause I was trying to think about this whole issue about the quota, um, um, you know, about the quota approach. And I think part of my hesitance at that idea of putting a quota was brought up by Dana and Natalia, that if even if we want to have a quota, that, you know, currently, as Dana was saying, there might not be a pool there. And as Natalia was saying, for there to be a pool there, they need to feel comfortable in it. They need to be like, there need to be a, a liaison with it. I think uh, currently, I, I don't think we're at the position that we want to do a quota. I think currently we want to give more spaces for um, re researchers in developing areas to, to basically um, uh, to join the PSA Common Ground, so in, which includes committee meetings, which includes us, um, spaces where they can accrue social capital and be made more visible in the network. Um, so in fact, if there were a quota, I wouldn't put it directly in the in the uh, uh, leadership level uh, as of yet. Maybe more of like, and this was Ilker's idea. Uh, Ilker has uh, been advocating for this for quite some time. Was to enlarge the committee member uh, committee member slots so that there are basically just more slots for more uh, geographically and culturally diverse people to join in. Um, even if there doesn't need to be a, a quota in there, just like more opportunities basically for them to, to, to join. And again, to, 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 to be put into the pipeline of leadership by participating, by accruing social capital, by all that. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, I'm not sure if, if um, I'll have to think more about all of these. Yeah, this is, I guess this is possibly a bit of a downer, <clears throat> excuse me, but I also wanted to like acknowledge that we have witnessed like from the perspective of PMs, like sometimes the lead authors might be on board conceptually with like what it means to collaborate with a diverse group of people, but then sometimes concretely like in getting comments back from people 
there's just a lot of kind of like bias and unwillingness to like take our colleagues seriously sometimes or you know i think some the the community of the psa and like you know this idea that like oh accent people are not judged based on their accents um it doesn't necessarily extend to the the lead author sometimes especially when they're coming from outside of the psa and like i have struggled so much like how do we like um, do we just, is that maybe something that we work on through this proposal? Like we really encourage proposals from people, like the more that we're supporting proposals from people who are, you know, Americans at these prestigious institutions, that's going to be a bigger dynamic than if we're supporting proposals from people that, you know, aren't, aren't in the U.S. or have, you know, either are from traditionally underrepresented places or institutions, et cetera. I'm not sure, but it's something that I've really struggled with because you can't be like, be respectful of other people. Like saying that isn't really enough. And there's cultural change needed in our field at large, I guess is what I'm saying. And we, we're kind of in a good position to come up against that and maybe change that. And hopefully we already are, but um, it's kind of depressing that even once we address this barrier, you know, there's, there's barrier after barrier here. Sorry, I just articulated it in my mind. Sorry, this isn't super tangential to what, was ha to what Hannah was saying. But I think part of my reservation again for the quota is that we have already good mobility within the PSA. We just really need to get people in it for them to be mobile then. I think uh, that's where the bottleneck really is, just like really getting them here. But again, when you see the conditions where they're working at, you know, it's hard to ask them to squeeze in more time from the day that they're just really squeezing out from. I know that's true for most of us as well, but usually, um, you know, uh, there's usually more support, more infrastructure, more understanding for Western academic institutions for these kinds of work rather than for developing countries work. So it is hard to say as well, just like, you know, come here and give me all of your extra time in your day. So uh, I'm not sure. That's why I'm wondering whether we couldn't just add this one question to the ethics survey about time commitment. Because if we, if we figure out that this is the bottleneck um, for engaging or, well, applying for <laughs> assistant directorships, then maybe you have to more transparently com communicate the time investment. Because it, it as uh, Kathleen, you said, it comes in waves. And it's you're never alone as we have it. That's why Bologna also stressed it. It's always two. So if someone is busy a semester with teaching, then the second ethics monitor takes a larger role. I think this isn't so clear for necessarily all members of the PSA. They may even play with the thought, but I think, no, I can't take this responsibility. It's too much. But I, 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 I think it's relative this too much. So, so maybe we can work on that, on this misunderstanding or misconception. I think there's a lot of misconception around there, how much time it is. Yes, you can invest a shitload of it. Yes, there are times where it can be a bit uh, on top of everything else, but you can signal it and then you're never alone in a, in a, in a team, um, in, in, in these committees. And it, it's, yeah, everything is voluntary. So we had people that dropped out of the ethics committee. And, uh, but maybe if this is not perceived as a, as a threshold or as a, as a barrier, then maybe we get more people from underrepresented uh, countries. I don't know, just putting it up. Yeah, can I just add to this uh, thread, even though I'm learning a lot uh, practically, I, I'm just soaking up all the experiences from the more experienced members. But anyhow, I mean, uh, I, I think everything that is mentioned here is basically an issue for the ethics committee and the work of all the others committees. Even Miguel had the line there put that uh, it's a moral obligation to include as diverse people as possible. Uh, so I kind of feel uh, responsible to give, provide some insight. Uh, so the way we are resolve, resolving the issue, uh, as Gerrit mentioned, is with shared responsibility. But uh, at the same time, we are aware that this can be misused in a way by displacing responsibility. So that's why we have this uh, policy and guidelines that act on as a sort of a contract, a contractor sheet 
in which people know what are their roles from the get-go. I know that the, they will be changed and this is flexible and it, it depends upon the project. So the policies along with shared responsibilities but not dispersed on too many people is the way forward in leading uh, uh, a committee. And now the other thing is how to motivate people from different regions from uh, less represented regions, the thing that uh, Miguel mentioned, and that they are already overwhelmed. And also if they are also assigned whether uh, the others will trust them, this is something that Hannah mentioned. These are all very valuable issues to discuss. And for sure, I will probably uh, assign a meeting with my committee at some of the, uh, with our committee uh, at some of the next meetings to discuss these issues. But also incentivizing is, uh, I'm pro incentivizing because either you incentivize either uh, or you oblige people. So uh, there should be some balance between those two and incentives are always good, at least for more responsible uh, positions. Thanks. I love that. Um, and just to echo what actually I got scooped while I was waiting uh, by Katya, so I'm just gonna echo Katya's point here. I think uh, like financial sustainability, I predict will be the biggest uh, diversity support uh, as Natalia was also saying, if, for example, the leadership roles or some of the more specialized roles were funded, that would help so much with, uh, with the willingness and, you know, the state sustainability of a developing researcher to engage in the role. Is it, can I speak? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I I was thinking uh, something that I'm I'm thinking about doing it and so next year is is something that I've been planning before and never did and I think I can help. So I just to to pick up from what like she said, we the incentivize or, or obligate people. Uh, uh, but I think there's something on um, sort of uh, like, like I don't know how the word is uh, we go through social learning so it's social learning can help instead of uh, we can promote seminars and workshops like we 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 are thinking of doing one uh, where people just can get to know PSA more so this is something that I think locals could do better so what I'm I've been thinking about doing contacting people we we have on PSA but we just stay like hidden and uh, contact these people and then we uh, can promote a seminar where, for example, Chris or Nicholas can talk about PSA uh, to these people. And the interesting thing, or just run a bunch of seminars about PSA for specifically focusing on, like we, we should have people organizing these things in those places. So in, uh, places of Africa, places of Latin America. And Latin America, I think we can even do something like, uh, because Nadia, Deborah and I, uh, and others have been in contact. So it's just, it can, can be a Latin America thing. Asia is capable, uh, some parts of Asia are capable of doing that as well. Uh, and we have these PSA seminars and people feel like they are part of something and then they, because of that, they feel more affiliated and then they feel more motivated to join us and work with us. So humans are like that. I studied that, so I don't know why I haven't thought of that before. And uh, so we could try something like that as well. Uh, and this is something that I wanted to do in Brazil because I feel I, in Brazil is like uh, you get someone uh, uh, like Lisa talking or Nicholas talking, uh, Miguel talking, people are interested because it's always talking about an interesting project. Somewhere else, yeah. I think we have time for one last comment from uh, Lisa. Oh, I can't. We lost Natalia. Okay, so I can't tell if it was my connection or her connection. I was just wondering, it's come up in a few other um, talks that some people are reluctant to join the PSA because they think they have to collect data. Um, and they don't. 
but we're not very explicit about like, what are the other tasks? If you're not a committee member and you're not collecting data, how do you get involved in a project? Um, are these things that might, might be especially barriers to um, people from certain regions where they might have different procedures for collecting data or less access to participants? And what should we be doing to, to make it clear that there are other ways to, to get involved and contribute? You can get your name on a paper by doing code check or, um, or helping with the ethics or whatever. I think maybe part of the issue is how we're defining the PSA as a network of research labs rather. And so some of that is by nature, people assume that they have to be a principal investigator of a research lab, at least in the way the network was um, initially pitched. So I think that some rebranding, so to speak, could be helpful and, and make it more about people than labs. And we've already even done that in terms of um, not like lab IDs versus person IDs and things like that. Um, but in general, just making it very clear that it's a network of people producing research and you can get involved even if you're at, at any level kind of thing. We should have more working meetings of the committees <laughs> more often. I think uh, the time is up. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we can uh, uh, follow the last two sessions. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending this session. Enjoy. <laughs>